Our Father, we thank you for our coming together once again for our final study in the general epistle of Jude. We thank you for the warnings you have given us, the instructions you have given us, and we thank you for the prayers we have prayed, the consecrations we have made, and we believe that you will confirm those consecrations by your mighty power in Jesus' name. That our commitment to follow you without looking back, you'll seal it with the blood of the Lamb in Jesus' name. And we pray you'll keep us till that final day. We open up our hearts to you now. Speak to us again, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. We come to the concluding study in the general epistle of Jude. And this concluding study will lead us to verses 17 through to 25. There are some verses of this section that are very clear, very plain, very easy to be understood. There are some of the verses, though, that will need some real explanation before we can fully understand. Let's read so we can have an understanding, a feel of what it reads like. From verse 17. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, not having the spirit. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the bless for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And some have of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and ever. Amen. From the things we've been studying from this short brief, urgent, and powerful epistle, we have discovered that in the last days, just before the coming of the Lord, there will be the denial of the faith. And from what we have read and studied, we have seen that careless Christians who are not watchful, those who are not vigilant, will be deceived and swept off from their steadfastness. Jude has given much teaching on apostasy, but now he brings us to the conclusion by showing us what to do to escape the deception of the apostates and to escape the suffering of apostates. In this conclusion, is calling us to steadfastness, supplication, and soul winning. It shows us how to remain and abide in grace, abide in the truth, and abide in love when everything else is falling apart. Like a faithful watchman who wants us to turn away from that which is dangerous and subversive, he has warned us of the presence, the power, and the preoccupation of the apostates in the last days. And he's calling us to remember the words of the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
It tells us there will be deceivers. There will be mockers. There will be scoffers. Just as the Lord himself had told us, there will be false prophets. There will be false Christs. And that these will increase as the age is coming to a close. But then he reminds us that God is able to keep us from falling. And he will keep us in Jesus' name. And then he tells us that this keeping by the Lord must also have the support of our willingness to be kept. He tells us very clearly that if we're going to be preserved unto the everlasting kingdom, there are two parties to our being stable, established, steadfast in the kingdom of God. The teachers of eternal security will concentrate on the divine side, the sovereignty of God. Unfortunately to you, the teachers of salvation by works will concentrate on the responsibility of man. Actually, there is a narrow way. A ditch on the one hand, a ditch on the other hand, leaning towards this side, the sovereignty of God, we try to excuse people that they have no responsibility. Everything is, is uh, the choice of God, the foreknowledge of God, the power of God, and because of the sovereignty of God, he is able to keep. You lean on that side, you forget the part you have to play, and you get into trouble. But those who preach salvation by works, they lean on the opposite extreme, the responsibility of man. Again, when you lean much on that side to you, without thinking of the power of God to keep, you also get into trouble. And so Jude is telling us, he says, there will be apostates. There will be apostasy. There will be difficulty. And yet, we need to be kept in the way of the Lord. And he brings the two together. There is the power of God that keeps. There is the responsibility of man to be kept. In verse 21, keep yourselves in the love of God. In verse 24, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. You see, it tells us the keeping on both sides. You rely on God, then you remember your responsibility. It's a combination of the sovereignty and the responsibility that actually keeps you in the faith. You say, I don't understand how that works. It's the paradox of the Christian life. And there are many things like that. If, for example, I asked you the question, who wrote the epistle to the Romans? You'll tell me, when you think very deeply, you'll say, God. And you're right. Because all scripture is given by inspiration of God. I asked you the question again. I said, think about it. Give me a different answer. Who wrote the epistle to the Romans? You say, it's Paul. He used his language. He used his understanding. He used his effort. He put the pen on paper and wrote every word. Every word had been written by God. Everything had been written by Paul. They are both responsible. God had his mind to pass unto us. And he could do it without Paul. But he condescended and chose to do it with Paul. And Paul relied on the Lord. Yet he still had to use the language he had been taught in school. And write everything down. And his language, his knowledge, his understanding, his background came into everything. And yet it was not his word. It is the word of God. And yet it is his word because of the vocabulary that he has learned. How do we understand that? You don't understand that is a paradox of the Christian life. 
it is God doing it, it is man doing it, and in God's own wisdom that is supernatural, that a mortal man cannot explain to you, it is a combination of the divine and the, and the human joining together, blending together, and when everything has been done, it is a product of God, it is the word of God, it is the mind of God. When our salvation has been finalized, it will be totally the work of God. And yet, your responsibility had been there. And so, Paul, uh, Jude is telling us, he says, even though there is apostasy, even though there are apostates, you understand, there is the preservation of the saints of God, of the children of God from apostasy. And that is what we're looking at today, saints' preservation from apostasy. Today, there are four points we're going to consider. Number one, warning against seduction. Warning against seduction. In Jude, from verse, 13, from verse 17. But, beloved, once again, let me remind you that uh, Jude referred to the saints of God, the children of God, the people of God as beloved. And that word appears more than 60 times in the New Testament. And it is showing how God has loved us and he has accepted us in the beloved. And now he looks at us not just because of who we are, but what Christ has done for us. Beloved, remember. He's calling the believers to remember. And uh, you will know that all the New Testament writers, they called the believers to remember. Because forgetfulness of the teaching of God's word is a major cause of spiritual deterioration. When you forget, we've learned many things. We have been instructed in many things. You will never backslide if you don't forget. If you are always remembering what the Lord said to you, what you said to the Lord, how Jesus died for you, how you accepted him, how Jesus taught you, how you received this word, what consecrations you made, what vow you made, what yieldedness you had voiced out before the Lord. If you always remember every moment of the day, every day of the year, you will never backslide. What causes backsliding? It is a forgetfulness of the teaching, of the goodness of God upon our lives, of the grace manifested unto us, of the promise we have made unto the Lord, of the very fact that heaven is waiting for us. It is when we forget, we deteriorate. And therefore, he's calling us, he says, remember. Remember the spiritual principles you have learned. Because that is the very backbone of your security. And remember that he himself is holding your hand and he wants you so that you'll be kept in the Lord. Now, as we look at the word of God, we find that we ministers, we have to remind our congregations many, many times. And Jude is doing the same thing here. And he's calling them to remember two things. I'll come back uh, to that later. He said, remember the old and remember the new. And we have to take the two parts of the word of God, the old and the new, the left and the right. And we have to understand that it is the combination of the totality of the word of God, the Old Testament, the New Testament, all the warnings were given, all the commandments were given, all the word of God were given. Remember everything and then you will be kept. Uh, you need to remind your own congregations too. Let's look at First Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter uh, 4, verse 6. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ. You see, if you read from verse 1, it's been talking of what will happen in the last days. The Spirit speaketh expressly. In the latter times, perilous times shall come. And all many will depart from the faith. And then he goes down to what the apostates will do. And then in verse 6, he said, Timothy... You know what? You need to put the brethren in remembrance of these things so that they will not forget. Look at uh, Second Peter, Second Peter chapter one, and in verse twelve. Wherefore, 
I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them and be established in the present truth. The very fact that you have known them, you have studied them, you are even established in them, in the truth of the word of God, doesn't mean that we will not be reminding you. It's our responsibility to always put you in remembrance. Chapter 3, verse 1. The second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of repentance. We must be reminding you all the time. First John chapter 2. In first John chapter 2, verse 24. Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye shall also continue in the Son and in the Father. That's the reason we need to be reminding ourselves and reminding our congregations of all these things that we have learned so that we'll be good ministers of the Lord Jesus Christ in Jude verse 17. But, beloved, remember ye the words spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last days who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. It's telling us we need to be put in remembrance of what the apostles had said. The apostles had said that there will be a falling away. The apostles had said that there will be mockers and scoffers in the last days. Now you will see here inspiration confirming and affirming the other parts of the New Testament. Jude is telling us it's not only this one that is inspired. I wanted to write unto you of the common salvation. While I was thinking and planning and deciding and taking diligence to write unto you, it became necessary. The Spirit of God impressed upon me. So all that I'm giving to you is the word of the Lord. And therefore he claims inspiration. But then he's telling us, it is not only Jude that is inspired. It says to remember the words of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. is claiming inspiration for the words of the apostles too. It's telling us the whole of the New Testament is inspired. Now when it says, they told us that deceivers will come. That the mockers will come. Where did they tell us? Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20 from verse 29 for I know this that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you not sparing the flock also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Jude said, remember those words of the apostles of the Lord. They told us that there will be departure from the faith. Second, First Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4. We're looking at where those apostles of the Lord where they told us that in the last days, mockers, deceivers, false prophets and teachers will come. First Timothy chapter 4, chapter 4 verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. They were in the faith before. If you have not been in a place, you can't depart out of the place you have never been in. They have been in the faith, but now they will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Chapter 6, verse 20 and verse 21. The apostles warned us, we're looking at their warning. O oh, Timothy. Keep that which is committed to thy trust 
avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Some who have been in the faith before because they went into philosophy and deceitful scientific thing that they used against their knowledge and their experience in the Lord. Now they have erred, they have gone away from the faith. The apostles have warned us. Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. And then he begins to tell us the characteristics of those days. Men will be lovers of their own selves. Then in verse 5, having a form of godliness, they will still be religious. But they deny the power thereof. From such, turn away. Chapter 4, verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Here is the warning of scripture that sound doctrine will not always be appealing. Sound doctrine will not always be inviting. Sound doctrine sometimes will go against our desires. And there are people that will not know that the medicines that cure are sometimes very often bitter. And therefore, you should look at the curing effect in the medicine, not at the taste of the medicine. Sound doctrine, because of the work it does, like a medicine that is supposed to cure you, strengthen you, and put you on your feet again. Sometimes that sound doctrine, like that effectual medicine, will be bitter. You look away from the taste, you know this is for my health. This is for my eternal life. You take it, even though it is not always sweet. But there are people that once the taste is not very sweet, they're going to spill it away. Therefore, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth. They will pack all the cases that has sound doctrine and the truth. They will say, enough. I don't want these cases again. Enough. All these cases that lay it upon me like two-edged sword, piercing me, making me feel guilty. Every time I listen, I have to go on my knees and cry and say how wretched I am. This kind of case that is disturbing my peace, piercing me, knocking me every time with fire in my soul almost wanting to make me run mental because I listen, I cry. I don't want any of these things anymore. They will turn their ears away from those cases, that sound doctrine and that truth, and it shall be turned unto fables. You see, the Lord has warned us, and the apostles of the Lord, they have warned us as well in um, Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Reading from verse 4. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you, deceive you, cajole you, blindfold you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, join and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Verse 8. Beware. Lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So Jude has been bringing us back to the words of the apostles. He says, well, what I'm telling you, am I the only one emphasizing this? He says, no. He says, remember. Remember the words which were spoken before of the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. How that they told you. You have heard this before. They told you that there should be mockers in the last time. That is in the last days. Who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. You see the word of God wants us about something. And it says something is coming. We shall stand our guard. 
so that when such things come, we would remember and will not be deceived. You are surprised sometimes. We come to a congress like this and we lay it line upon line, precept upon precept, and like we came last year. And when we came last year, we studied the words of the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 24. And there we traced everything. And we prayed, we cried unto the Lord. And yet, even though we did that in January, and we were warned of false prophets and false cries, and we were also one with the words of the Lord Jesus Christ that because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And then we encouraged ourselves that whosoever shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. We listened to all that January 1995, and yet not everybody remained in the faith until December 95. Not that we don't hear. Not that we have not preached it, but we are not remembering. When the temptation comes, we forget what we heard at the Congress. When the people that will deceive and entice, when they come, we do not remember what we heard at the Congress. And so Jude is telling us, he said, it is not just hearing it, remember. Remember that the apostles said, and these were the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. They said that these deceivers will come. And now that we know, and we know that not all the people that had the messages of last year, not all of them, are remaining till this time. We then now should be very watchful. Because apostates, they do not only have wrong theology, they have wrong motives. And they have evil character. And uh, verse 19 tells us, let me remind you again of the triplets of Jude. It's fond of those three things, of uh, using three things. Number one, it said, they be, that is, they are they. They are those who separate themselves, number one. Number two, they are sensual. Number three, they are not having the spirit. That means then, they are separatists. They are sensual. They do not have the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. As they are separatists, they create factions and divisions. They split congregations. They do not worry what will end, what will be the end of the new converts. They are not worried about the new converts getting confused. They do not have the love of God. You know, the, when you really have the love of God and the love of the people, you are very, very careful what you do. Two women came to Solomon. And one child had died. The other child was still alive. And uh, the mother of the living child said, This child is mine. And uh, the mother of the dead child said, what do you mean that the living child is yours? That living child is mine. And the argument was terrible. And Solomon said, what shall we do? The one says, the living child is mine. The other one says, the living child is mine. And Solomon said, bring me a sword there. We're going to divide this living child into two. Kill the child. Give you half, give you half. The one that is not really having the love, the compassion for that child, and doesn't want that child to belong to the real mother, that the mother of the dead child said, that's right, Solomon, that's what you should do. Kill that one. Divide into two, and uh, then it will not belong to anybody. And Solomon said, because the other woman said, Solomon, give her the child. So the child can remain alive. Solomon said, that's the mother of the child. You see, you should watch that in the church. When in the church, somebody rises up and he says, we are going to scatter this congregation. I am leaving. But not only that I will leave. All these people that are quietly sitting down, hearing about salvation, hearing about sanctification, 
Hear me about the Holy Ghost baptism, singing to the Lord, making consecration to the Lord, offering themselves to evangelize, and they are getting ready for heaven. I am leaving. All of them, we are going to divide the thing. And we don't care for the new converts. We don't care for people that will stumble. We don't care for what will happen to some people that will see the confusion and get away and not remain in deeper life and not come to join you and they stray away. We don't think about the consequence of our action. It means we are not the real shepherds of the people. We are not the real mother of the living child. It's the real mother of the living child that is crying, saying, Oh God, they are scattering the congregation. They are confusing the new converts. And they are scattering everybody and some people that are not even going with them. When they see the confusion and they say, ah, ah, The people that taught us sanctification. Look at the way they are doing. Even the preacher, the pastor, that is still remaining in deeper life in his preaching will be throwing stone at the one that has gone. The one that has gone will be throwing stone back at the one that is still in deeper life. When the young converts, when they see that, they say, even this deeper life I cannot stay. See how this deeper life is talking. Throwing stone at the other man that left. And then he tries to go to the other side to say, maybe I will join them because everybody is throwing stone at him. Let me go and join him. He joins him there. One hour, the man outside is also throwing his own stone at deeper life. The young convert will say, I will not stay anywhere. These people that are fighting, this is not what they taught us. They taught us before that when somebody has cheated you, when you are suffering wrongfully, take it patiently. All of them now, the one in deeper life, the one outside deeper life, they are not taking it patiently. I'm not going to remain. And many lives are lost. You see, if you look at what Solomon did with those women, he knew that the one that had the compassion, the one that said, I'll be careful of my words. I'll be careful of my action. I do not want any soul to be destroyed because of what are we fighting about. We're fighting about position. We're sending people to hell. We're fighting about I must have office. I must be an overseer. And we're sending people to hell. Be very careful. We're not carrying position to heaven. Even if we tread upon you. Even if we push you. Even if we knock you. Even if we cheat you. For the sake of of the souls that may perish. If you take a wrong action, stay there and let God fight for you. The people of today, they don't want God to fight for them. They say, God, you are too slow. You don't fight for anybody anymore. I'll fight for myself. Don't fight for yourself. That's dangerous. And so you find, it says, these apostates, what do they do? Three characteristics. Number one, they separate themselves. Not only that they separate themselves, the consequence of their separatist attitude will be that they scatter the flock. Number two, they become sensual. And you find out the people, they just give everything over to the flesh. And they say, now we are no more in that holiness a group. We are no more in that holiness assembly. Now we can talk whatever we want to talk, eat whatever we want to eat. Live in any kind of place we want to live. There's no moderation anymore. There's no sobriety anymore. There's no self-denial anymore. The marks of discipleship are lost once they have separated, they said, well, I was living that kind of humble life, quiet life, sober life, because of deeper life, not because of conviction in the word of God. And you see some of the ladies that have led, and then you see them one month after. You see the sensuality, you see the palming, you see the lipsticks, and you see all the extravagance and everything. You know that something apart from living deeper life has happened. Therefore, they separate, and not only that, they are sensual. Now it says they have not the spirit. And in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, we're told, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, it's none of his. And uh, unfortunately, these apostates, they become the heads of theological institutions. These apostates, they are the authorities in the council of churches. And they are the leaders in major, major denominations. Now, you will sometimes wonder why um, a person like me that uh, reads the Bible and some preachers like me will take a hard line on denominations. 
we take a very hard line on council of churches i take a very hard line on theological institutions and all those places you wonder why the reason is because the bible says very clearly that in the latter days many will depart from the faith and i happen to know that heads of many theological institutions i happen to know that the communities and councils of churches many of them they have nothing to do with the new birth they have nothing to do with holiness they have nothing to do with the reality and the truth of the word of god that's why when the bible says the word of god says come out from among them and be separate says the lord and touch not the unclean thing and i will receive you and i will be a father unto you and ye shall be my sons and daughters says the lord almighty that's why we take that kind of stand that it says you mark the people that bring any other doctrine to you and they do not remain and they are teaching you contrary to the things you have learned and avoid them it says in the last days that uh, there will be deceivers that will come into the world it says this is why we know it is the last time because of the many deceivers that have gone into the world it says if they come unto you and bring not this doctrine receive them not into your house don't even beat them god's speed because he that beats them god's speed is partaker of their evil deed therefore that is why if you are really in these last days wanting to stand on the totality of the word of god you will not bring in a nigerian situation here the celestial and the catholic and the cherubim and seraphim and the cac and the deeper life and the assemblies of god and the four square and the, you know chapel of glory and chapel of resurrection and chapel of beauty and chapel of jewelry and a chapel of dancing and a chapel of a merriment and a chapel of a liberty you won't bring everybody together and then they call a deeper life person to come and say the grace we don't do that here we take a very hard line because we know these are the last days and we you need to keep that which you have if you don't keep that which you have you are trying to save the other fellow he knocks away what you have from you he doesn't make it you don't make it and the kingdom of god will lose both of you so that's why if we see that uh, if we can help other churches and they are willing to learn about salvation they're willing to learn about holiness they're willing to learn about the moral standard of the word of god that's all right that's all right we'll be able to help them we'll be able to share the word of god together but if they say don't talk to us about salvation don't talk to us about holiness don't talk to us about sound doctrine all we want is just that we be together we say no it's a waste of our time and time is not enough to even do the work god has given us to do therefore we are not going to waste our time sitting with somebody or wasting our life wasting our resources on things that they do not want the word of god god has given us the whole bible I will never feel convenient in any association, in any congregation, where they will stop my mouth, close my mouth, and I cannot see the totality of the word of God. I want to be able to say that by the grace of God, all I know, anywhere I go, I'm able to declare it. Then I will know there is no guilt on me. But where we have to be careful that now we are here, you cannot talk holiness. You are here, you cannot talk restitution. You are here, you cannot talk about one man, one wife. It's a waste of time to be there. And uh, the people that are establishing this one, this one, I get a lot of invitations. And um, somebody was asking me last, uh, you know, I think this last month, December, he said, uh, my pastor, I want to ask you a question. That I happen to be a person in the uh, Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship. And uh, anytime we invite you, you don't come and i we wonder why you don't honor our invitation and i saw it was very sincere i said you really want to know the truth he said yes i said there are two things number one i'm so busy with my responsibility here that really is very very difficult for me to still carve out the time and uh, go to any other place i said that's one but then i said the greater reason is this that i've been there before and when I got there, 
it had a negative effect on my primary assignment. He said, how? I said I was invited to the full business uh, gospel something, and the women with all their jewelry, palming, painting, everything, you know, the dancing, the drumming, and all that. And I felt, okay, I'm only here to preach, and so I'll just leave them with what they're doing and preach what I want to preach. And so I stood up, I preached the word of God, and I gave the altar call, did everything I thought I should do. But then, some people in our own church here in Lagos, they learned that I had gone to such a place. Ah, they said, if pastor went there, it means those people are doing right. That pastor will not have been there if those people were doing something that was wrong. And those women, not one, not two, in this, our Lagos church, they all, the uh, jewelry they had abandoned, all the palming, painting they had abandoned before, just because they learned that I went to a place like that, they brought everything back on themselves. And they were telling other people, they began to campaign for worldliness. And they were talking, they were saying, ah, sit down there. Pastor goes to this other side. And, uh, you know, they were dancing. And they had all that. And pastor, our pastor was there. And he preached. And they loved him. And he loved them. And therefore, everything is okay. I told the brother that asked me the question, I said, now, put yourself in my position. If my extracurricular activity, the one I go to do outside, will scatter this one, where I will give account to the Lord, I said, if you are myself, will you be jumping about? He looked at me and he knew that I was talking sense. You see, as leaders, where you go, many people will use those things. That's why, you, if you are a leader, you are a real child of God, determine what's your purpose of ministry. What's the purpose in your life? I love to help everybody. I love to help the whole world if I could. But God has not called me to help the whole world. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. He gives me only a portion of the work to do. I want to be faithful in that portion he has given me to do. If there is time, I do the extra. If the extra is going to stop, is going to spoil the major assignment God has given in my hand, I have to be reasonable. And therefore, you need to understand. Maybe I should even tell you something. And uh, the brethren from London, please uh, listen to me. We have trouble here in Nigeria. The trouble we have in Nigeria is that some people in Nigeria, they are using the London church, deeper life, as an excuse for what leanness. And people have told me, some people have said, Pastor goes to London, and he goes every year, and he goes to the fellowship there, and they, whenever they travel, they've gone to the London church, and uh, also when they come back, they begin to tell one another. They say, ah, the London church is different. That the worldliness in the London church, you will not believe. And then they begin to say that, but Pastor goes there every year. And pastor approves everything going on in London. Because of that, they are giving us a hell of trouble in Nigeria here. And there are people that are using London to cancel the standard of the word of God we're teaching here. I need to tell you now, you from Africa, ask any of those London people. Whenever I go to their conference, I talk straight, I talk firm, and I stop my message in the middle... And I tell them, you people, you are not doing right. Your music, your dressing, and I lay it on them. But, you know, although they are Nigerian, 99, 98 to maybe 95 to 98 percent of them, but they do not have the concept we have in Nigeria that when you are told the word of God, you obey. They are like the people over there. You can say whatever you want to say. Many of them will not obey. So if you go there, and you see anything, don't come back to Nigeria here and spoil deeper life here. And say that pastor goes there every year. I don't know whether I'll still be going every year because it can be a waste of my time too. That pastor goes there every year and yet they're doing this, they're doing this. You don't know what we're telling them. We're only being patient with them. Therefore, don't use anything what you hear from the pulpit here. What you hear from the word of God, stop.
stand on the word of God. And then I'll be sure that if I'm not able to take those other people to heaven, at least I'll be able to take you to heaven. Therefore, we understand. We see that uh, the attitude of these people and uh, the apostle or the writer of Jude was warning them, warning against seduction. Now I go to point number two. Watchfulness with supplication. Watchfulness with supplication. We're looking at it from verse 20. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Here we have uh, what uh, the apostle or what the writer is telling us about watchfulness. And it is watchfulness with supplication. It says uh, in verse uh, 20, and if you really see verses 20 and 21, it's one single sentence. Because at the end of verse 20, you have a command. But the real center of that sentence is what you have at the beginning of verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God. It lays it upon us as a responsibility that we are the people to watch. We are the people to keep ourselves. You see, there is a major thing. That we need to take care, you look at your life, you look at your responsibility, you look at everything, and then you say, I have a role, I have a part to play, I must keep myself. Now I told you earlier, there are people that think that we have nothing to do concerning our salvation, concerning our remaining self as in that Christian life that we have nothing to do. But here it says, here is your part. Here is your responsibility. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Look at 1 John and see your responsibility. 1 John chapter 5, verse 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that believeth, he that is begotten of God, keepeth himself. That's your responsibility. He keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. Verse 21, little children, here is your responsibility. Keep yourselves from idols. We have a responsibility, and that is to keep ourselves. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, but I keep my body. I keep under my body. You see, it is our responsibility that we will keep our body. And then it says, I bring it to subjection. It's your responsibility. Lest by any means, we, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a cast away. You want to be very sure that you're even keeping your soul because it's possible to preach to many others and if you are not playing your part, you're not carrying out your own responsibility, your own soul could be lost. In um, 1 Timothy chapter 5, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 22, the last, uh, let me read the whole thing, lay hands suddenly on no man. Neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. It's God who purifies. It's God that makes holy. It's God that sanctifies. But you have a part to play. Keep thyself pure. In James chapter 1. James chapter 1 verse 27. Pure religion. And undefiled before God and the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and the widows in the affliction. And to keep himself. You have a part to play. To keep himself unspotted from the world. And so as we look at the word of God. We see this area of watchfulness. You are watching over yourself. You keep yourself in the arena of the love of God. And then how do you do that? Jude is telling us uh, how to do it. Come back to Jude. Verses uh, 20 and 21. He tells us in verse 21, keep yourself in the love of God. Now he gives us three verbs in the continuous tense. 
as to how we are to keep ourselves. In verse 20, building up yourself. That's the number one thing. Number two, praying in the Holy Ghost. Number three, you find in verse 21, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. There are three things then we are told, building, praying, looking. And these are the three things that ought to occupy our lives if we are really going to do what the Lord wants us to do in that he wants us to be kept in the love of God, in the arena of the love of God. Number one, building up yourself on your most holy faith. The faith, saving faith, living faith, is the foundation upon which you build in uh, Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1 from verse 5. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. The faith is a foundation. Now you are building on that most holy faith. You are adding in verse 5, you are adding virtue. You are adding knowledge. You are adding temperance. You are adding patience. You are adding godliness. You are adding brotherly kindness. You are adding charity. You see, that's how you build up. The faith is there. The living faith is there. The saving faith is there. And then there will be character building. There will be knowledge. The knowledge of the word of God. You are building up all those things in your life. It is, if these things be in you, those things you are adding, and they are bound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the number one thing, you're building up yourself. And you build yourself by the word of God. Acts of the Apostles. Acts chapter 20. Reading verse 32. And now brethren, I commend you to God. And to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. The word of his grace, which is able to build you up. Then the next thing is praying. You are building, you are praying. Praying in the Holy Ghost. This one is not limited to what the Charismatics and the Pentecostals say. What the Charismatics say is only part of the truth. It's only part of the area of praying in the Holy Ghost. When you pray in tongues, when you pray in that language unlearned, when you pray with that language given by the Spirit of God, you're building up yourself. We know that because we have that in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. But it's more than that. The Holy Ghost influences. He counsels. He consoles. He helps. He instructs, he reveals. When you are praying, even when it is in your language, and you are praying under the influence of the Spirit of God, it may be in your language. For example, now I'm preaching, and I'm preaching under the influence of the Holy Ghost. When I rebuke, when I correct, when I encourage, when I love, when I chastise, it is under the influence of the Holy Ghost. And even though I'm using the language I understand and the language you understand, it is still under the influence of the Holy Spirit, under the help of the Holy Spirit, under the revelation and the instruction of the Holy Spirit. Same thing in prayer. When you are praying and the prayer, although it is in your normal language, and it is in a language you understand, and language other people understand, it is under the influence of the Holy Ghost, under the consolation of the Holy Ghost, under the help and instruction and revelation of the Holy Ghost, you are praying in the Spirit. Don't be limited to what the Charismatics and the Pentecostals are saying on that matter. And that means then, it's just like you are walking in the Spirit. And you ought to be walking in the Spirit every day. That doesn't mean that when you are living your life, it means that your behavior, your character should be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. If your character, your behavior is under the influence of the Holy Spirit, you are walking in the Spirit. Then it says, living in the Spirit and not making provision for the flesh. That is still talking about your behavior, your conduct, your character. 
once your character is under the help, under the control, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, that's not talking about speaking in tongues, it's just saying yield everything to the Holy Ghost. And then you are walking straight according to the Word of God, you are living in the Spirit. The same thing you are praying in the Spirit. At times you are praying in the Spirit, you speak in tongues. At other times you are praying in the Spirit, you speak in your normal language, but that prayer is influenced and directed by the Holy Ghost. Now, the third word, it talks about your building. It talks about you are praying in the Holy Ghost. And then it talks about, number three, you are looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. That mercy there is eschatological study. You are looking for the mercy to be revealed at the time of the coming of the Lord that ushers you into life eternal. And you are looking, you are desiring, you wake up in the morning, you are saying, Oh Lord, I don't know whether the Lord will come today. Therefore, every good thing I ought to do, every good thing I ought to say, everything that I need to set right and make right, it is today I must do it because I am looking for the coming of the Lord. It is those who look for and love is appearing. That, that are kept holy, chaste, and pure for the coming of the Lord. Let's come back to Jude as we go to point number three. This point number three is witnessing to endangered souls. Witnessing to endangered souls. Jude verses 22 and 23. And of some have compassion, making a difference. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Here you know it's talking about soul winning. Save them with fear. Have compassion on them. But then he's telling us that there are different groups here. The church is responsible to preach the gospel to every creature. But listen. No individual is responsible for preaching the gospel to every creature. No individual can do that. But the whole church, the aggregate of all the members of the church, we are all responsible for preaching the gospel to the whole world. Having said that, you need to understand, there are some people you cannot reach. There are some people I cannot reach. And you need to know that and be very reasonable. Many years ago, when I was a new convert, I'd been born again just for about two years. And I was at the university at that time. And we had a student in our class. And this student had read many, many atheistic ideologies. And I'd been talking to him. And he said, you're too young. Take me to your pastor. And uh, so, even though we were eight mates, when he said you are two young, he was saying that although you came also from the background of atheism, but you have not gone as far as I have gone. I've read all those things. I don't believe there is God. I don't believe there are angels. I don't believe there is heaven. I don't believe anything supernatural or spiritual. And I tried to help him uh, since I understood part of the philosophy and uh, the psychology and the things that he was talking about. But he said, no, take me to your pastor so that we can talk about it. And then I set a date and, and my pastor uh, blessed his heart at that time, a very loving, gentle person. And uh, when he taught the Bible to those of us who knew the Lord who were born again, I really appreciated his teaching. But uh, bless his heart, he knew his limitation. I took the man, I brought the man to church, and after we finished our Sunday school, uh, which we now call Sunday Scripture, and then we finished the service, I went to the pastor, and uh, I, he was still sitting down. I wanted to go and talk to the pastor. I said, I brought somebody from my mathematics class. And uh, said, oh, that's wonderful. But I said, uh, I've been talking to him. He has read Thomas Paine. He has read, um, you know, this one. He has read uh, Churchill. He has read, I, I gave him some of the writers that he had never had those names in his life, my pastor. 
And then I gave him some of the argument and metaphysical things that this other fellow was uh, talking about. I said, this man doesn't believe in God. He doesn't believe there is God. doesn't believe there is angel. He argues like this and argues like this. My pastor said, stop. He said, uh, do you say it's in the church? I said, yes, sir. Uh, what has he come to do? He wants to see you so that you can talk to him. He feels that if you get involved in the argument that uh, he, you will be able to convince him. He said, uh, don't let him see me. Take him back to your campus. We will be praying for him. Then I learned that my pastor himself didn't want to be confused. Because even the little I told him that the man had been saying, he said, take him back to the campus. He was wise. So that we don't lose our pastor, his heart will not be filled with all the ideologies of atheism. Do you know that you yourself should be as wise like that? There are three groups here that are spoken about. We are to win souls. But you cannot win all these three categories of people. There may be people in the kingdom of God that God has equipped and God has trained and God has raised up to be able to reach these people. Which are the three groups? Group number one. Of some have compassion. These are the people the apostates had gone to them and they had confused them. Although they are deceived and seduced and victimized by the error of the apostates, they are still at the brink. They are still at the low level. They do not have too much of argument that will confuse you. They are sinners, but they are helpless captives of sin. They are ignorant followers of the false prophets. Although they may be Jehovah's Witnesses, they do not know the doctrines and the dogma and the error of the Jehovah's Witnesses thoroughly. Although they might, uh, be, they might be celestial and all that, they have not gone deep into occultism. They have not gone deep into how to do this and do this, and they have not gone into the magical part of that system. They are still at the periphery. They are just miserable sinners looking for solace and looking for help somewhere. Although they are going to that other side, really they have not gone very deep. Now go ahead and have compassion on them and talk to them. You can handle them. But we have second group. Others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. Aha, uh -huh. this one has gone further. These are sinners and backsliders that require both compassion and caution. You are saving them and you are afraid of your own life. You are saving them, you are watching that although you want to save them, you yourself will not get into the fire. Why is it that he took Jesus Christ himself to personally appear to Paul, Saul of Tarsus, to bring him to the Lord. And he had to be blind before Ananias could get to him. Guess what would have happened if the vision on the road to Damascus had never taken place? Guess what would have happened? He was coming from Jerusalem. He landed in Damascus and he was still breathing out threatening. He had paper in his hand. Anybody that he saw, he would take them, throw them into the prison. Guess what would happen if Ananias just went there and the man was seen and, he said, and says, Saul, good afternoon. I'm one of the disciples here in Damascus. You are holding Oh, they'll send him to the prison immediately because that's the job he went to do there. But the Lord made him blind on the way and asked him a question and said, Why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus. Are you? What will I do now? Okay, go to Damascus. After he had been broken, after he had been blinded, then he said, Ananias, go to that place and ask of Saul. Me? Ask of Saul? Choose another person, I cannot do that. Oh, he said, I've started the work already, he is blind. 
Ah, uh, all right, if he is blind. Not only that, he been praying for the last three days and three nights. So, uh, then now I can go. That's telling you something. That you need the help of God. All the sinners are not alike. All the sinners are not the same. Therefore, that is why you'll be very careful if you know that this one has gotten near the rim or the edge of hell. And he doesn't care. He will spew out against the face of the Lord. Be very careful. Sometimes, uh, you know, some people, uh, they say, I heard that uh, so-and-so was a gospeler before. And, but that now he's backsliding. I'm going to go to him and talk to him. And then uh, when you get to such a person, you take a verse of the Bible, he picks up that verse from you, he twists it and confuses you. You pick another one, by the time you come back, you're almost a backslider yourself. He is still a backslider, you have not helped him. You are almost a backslider yourself. Be wise. Number three, others save with fear Hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Ah, uh, these ones, they are like the Jezebels. And you say you want to reach them. Sometimes I'm surprised some of the uh, men, uh, a brother will rise up and he will make an announcement. He says, I've got a vision. I will say, what vision have you got? He said, God has given me a new ministry. What ministry is that? A ministry to the prostitutes. That I will be going to the place where they are practicing that prostitution. It is a new ministry God has given me. Well, bye-bye. We may never see you again. Hating the garments that are spotted with sin. You think anybody can just reach out to Delilah? Delilah is very clever. Because uh, Delilah, a person that could catch and subdue and weaken and paralyzed, spiritually paralyzed, a man like Samson, that woman, if you say you have a ministry towards her, pray very well. And uh, the Jezebel in the New Testament, that this Jezebel was in the church. Even the pastor of that church could not deal with that Jezebel. She was seducing my servants to commit fornication and need the things that are sacrificed to idols. And she had a lot of followers in that little church there. Be very careful. You see, it is not uh, all women that uh, you men can reach. Uh, you, you see some of the women, thank God they, they are not here. We are leaders here. But, uh, you know, they are outside there and they may be there in your village. Uh, that's why we have women ministry. Let the women like themselves go and help them. And don't get yourself into unnecessary danger. And so we have all these groups, and yet we are told in the church there should be those who are matured. There should be those who are very faithful to the Lord. There should be those who are zealous. There should be those who, by the grace of God, will be able to do what needs to be done. And you do your part, I do my part, she does his part, he does his part. All of us will be able to reach the whole world. But there are some your intelligence cannot reach. There are some your understanding, your knowledge cannot reach. The ones your knowledge can reach, reach them with caution, with compassion, with carefulness. And the ones you cannot reach, be praying for them, others will reach them. Point number four, worship of God our Savior. Here Jude brings everything now to a close. In verse 24, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and forever. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Here Jude ends with a fourfold ascription of praise to the one and only God of both time and eternity. And these things, it says, they cannot be excelled anywhere. He talks about glory. It says, to him be glory. Glory is the sum of all the divine attributes in their radiance shining forth. And therefore it says, to him be all the divine attributes 
with radiance uh, beaming shining forth all the time forever and ever then he talks about majesty majesty includes everything that constitutes what is really great and magnificent then he talks about dominion and that is speaking of a strength to carry out his purposes that he has so much dominion that neither satan nor demons men or women will be able to stop the plan of god and then he talks about power that talks about his right to rule and he talks about his sovereign authority and then he tells us with all this glory with all this majesty with the dominion and the power we should know that the Lord is able to keep us from falling. Is he able? And then he's able to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. And I pray that he will keep you until the end. Actually, it's not difficult to be kept. It's not difficult to be preserved if you are willing to be kept. And I'm sure you want to be kept. And we do not know how short the time is. But for many of us, maybe for the majority of us, the troubles we have seen in the past, which we have overcome, they are more than the troubles that are yet to come. And the God who helped us in the years past, he will continue to help us. If you think about all the people that are here today, if I were to uh, give you a chance and tell every brother here, every sister here, and write the toughest, most difficult persecution you have gone through. If I allow every brother, every sister to, uh, to write down the greatest, most sensitive temptation you have gone through that God gave you the victory. And the most terrible time, the most perilous time, the most trying thing that came upon your life since you became a Christian. If I allowed you to write everything down, and then we collect everything together, and I stand up here, and I tell you, uh, listen to what I'm reading. Brother A has gone through this, this, and this. This particular year, God gave him victory. Sister B writes here, the persecution, the terrible thing that she went through. And then I describe everything, and you say, what? Anybody in this generation has gone through that. And then I go to Sister C and Brother D. And I go on un until I read everything. When you see what all the other believers, even in this assembly, what we have gone through, what we have overcome already, you will say, I don't have any problem. If all these people were sitting down together here, if they have gone through all that, and God has kept them faithful. And they are here as if they had never gone through any problem. What? You tell me that so much water has gone under their bridge. And the bridge is still standing. And the bridge has not collapsed. Ah, there is no problem. I know I will overcome. And I know you are going to overcome in Jesus name. But you still have to watch. Let me end with this account. In 1 Kings chapter 13. In 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 1, Behold, there came a man of God out of Judah. By the word of the Lord unto Bethel and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name. And upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, where and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. And he gave a sign that same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes uh, are, uh, that are upon it shall be poured out. And it came to pass when the king Jeroboam had the saying of the man of God, which he had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand, which he stretched, he put forth against him, dried up, so that he could not pull it in again to him. The altar also was rained, and the ashes poured out, 
uh, from the altar according to the sign which this man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me that my hand may be restored me again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again, and became as it was before. And the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me, and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. And the man of God said, said unto the king if thou wilt give me half thine house i will not go in with thee neither will i eat bread nor drink water in this place for so it was charged me by the word of the lord saying eat no bread drink no water nor turn again by the way that thou camest and he went another way and returned not by the way he came to bethel so far so good up to this point in your life, so far, so good. All the temptations you have overcome, all the persecutions you have endured, so far, so good. All your responsibilities, everything you have done for the expansion of the kingdom of God, so far, so good. All your consecration and submission to the Lord, I will not allow anything to draw me back, so far, so good. This man of God, he was saying to do something, and he did it. And the king stretched out his hand and said, take him. And then God defended a servant. Don't defend yourself, only God will defend his own. And his hand dried up. And then the king said, entreat the Lord for me, pray for me. He prayed for him, a miracle took place, and the miracle of judgment uh, turned to become the miracle of mercy. And so he said, now you must come home with me. You need to eat, you need to drink. And I need to also give you some reward. He said, I'm sorry. I cannot accept that. Because the word of the Lord has told me not to go home with you, not to eat bread, not to drink water in this place, even if you will give me half of your kingdom, half of your possession, half of all your property, I will not accept. And he left and he went another way. Now the rest of the story. Verse 11. Now, there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel, the words which he had spoken unto the king. Them they told also to their father, and their father said unto him, What way went he? For his sons had seen what way the man of God went, which came from Judah, and he said unto his son, Saddle me the ass. So they saddled him the ass, and he rode thereon, and went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak. And he said unto him, Art thou the man of God that camest from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said unto him, Come home with me, and eat bread. How can you be in our city? Don't you know I'm a prophet like you are? I heard you came, and you went back. Don't you have fellowship with other prophets? Don't you discuss with others? Are you so isolated? You just came and you ministered and then you are gone? Come back. And he said in verse 16, I may not return with thee, nor go with thee, go in with thee, neither will I eat bread, nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, Thou shalt, not, thou shalt eat no bread, nor drink water, there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. And he said unto him, I am a prophet also, as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. Many old prophets will lie to you after this congress. After you have consecrated, after you have made up your mind, after you have said, I want the Lord to keep me to the very end, they will talk of vision, they will talk of revelation, they will talk of what they are going to give you. They will say, are you happy to remain the way you are suffering? We will give you money, we will give you whatever you need. In fact, why should I come to you? Are you the only one in town? I saw revelation, I saw vision, and the Lord sent me to you 
to make you come to the other side. They will lie unto you. And then in verse 19, the young prophet believed the lie of the old prophet. So he went back with him and did eat bread in his house and drank water. You know the story. I'm only reminding you. In verse 24, and when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him. And his carcass was cast in the way, and the ass stood by it, and the lion also stood by the carcass. And behold, the men that passed by and saw the carcass cast in the way, and the lion standing by the carcass. And they came and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. And when the prophet that brought him back from the way had thereof, he said, It is the man of God who was disobedient unto the word of the Lord. Therefore, the Lord has delivered him unto the lion, which has torn him and slain him according to the word of the Lord, which he spake unto him. And then, when he got there, in verse 30, and he laid his carcass in his own grave. He buried that man in his own grave, in the grave of the liar, in the grave of the old prophet. And he mourned over him, saying, Alas, my brother. He didn't take his body to the city he came from to go and bury him in the right place in the sepulchre of his fathers. He buried him in a strange land. I don't know where you will end up your Christian life. In the strange land. I don't know what will happen the last moment and the last event in your life. Whether you'll be taken by the hands of angels to heaven or you'll be torn by the lion that is roaming up and down seeking who may be devour. You make the choice yourself. Rise up and let us pray. The Lord is able to keep us if we are willing to be kept. Keep yourself in the love of God. Don't joke with your salvation. You have your part to play. There is a human responsibility alongside God's sovereignty. Leave your hands in the hand of the Lord. Make up your mind you are going to remain with the Lord. Whatever temptation, whatever trial, whatever persecution you are going through now, somebody here has gone through that persecution before and he overcame. And she overcame. If all our brothers and sisters here, some of them have gone through what you are going through now and they overcame, then you can overcome.
how will you end your Christian life? What will be the last event in your very life? Are you going to allow any of the old prophets to deceive you? Be wise. You've started well. Continue with the Lord.